Welcome, ladies. Welcome, welcome. I am so excited to be with you today. Um, it is such an honor to be able to moderate this wonderful panel and such an honor to be here with you ladies. Um, my name is Shawnee Coleman. I am the Director of Community and Economic Development for Clark County. And um, again, th this is such a wonderful event for for women and everybody in the community and um, really uh, honored to be a part of it. Uh, we have some wonderful, wonderful ladies with, uh, with me today that we're gonna be talking about uh, making sense of government, right? So everybody's belly is full from lunch, everybody. And you all came to this session to hear about government and so we are going to do our very best not to put you to sleep this afternoon and make sure you get what you, get what you came for. So um, as we get started, I want to make some quick introductions. Uh, we have the, the very wonderful Kirsten Van Rye. She is the Nevada from the Nevada Treasurer's Office. She's the Chief of Staff. Um, she joined the office in 2019 after serving as Deputy Chief of Staff for the Lieutenant Governor. Um, she was born and raised in Las Vegas. Hey, give it up for everybody born and raised in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, the biggest passions in her life are her family, reading, swimming, and snacks. So I have to ask, what kind of snacks? What's the favorite? Sweet or salty? Salty and crunchy. Crunchy. Yes. Yeah, I'm a popcorn girl myself, yep. so yeah. I get, I get it. Um, we also have Miss Danielle Anthony. Uh, she is the Deputy Treasurer for Nevada's Treasurer's Office of Unclaimed Property Division. Um, she has been in this position for eight months, but she has been with the Treasurer's Office for four years. Um, she's worked for the state for 10 years, so give it up for the longevity of government employee. She's one of those employees that you don't let go because they have all that institutional knowledge and you figure you, as soon as they walk out the door, you're like, dang, what happened, right? Um, she previously worked in, the, uh, in audit capacities at the Nevada Gaming Control Board and in unclaimed property. She is a dog person. What's your favorite dog or what kind of dog do you have? I have a lasso opso and a rat terrier. Okay, okay. Um, and she went to the University of Nevada, Reno We'll, we'll accept you. This, this, this is UNLV territory right here, so you know, I'll, I'll give you, it. I'll give you a pass for it. this panel. <laughs> and then we have the incomparable Miss Asha Jones, right? She is Chief of Staff for Congressman Stephen Horsford's office. She has worked in local, state, and federal government in areas ranging from government affairs to grant writing. Um, always focus on advocacy and building paths to bridge to bridges to success. Uh, she was born in Spokane, Washington, but she was raised in Las Vegas and attended UNLV. See, she did it right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> she did it right. Um, her biggest passion is service, but uh, entering a season of self-care and seeking balance. Can we give it up for these wonderful ladies? Thank you. I want to thank you so much for being here. And so we'll, we'll just uh, jump into it. And whoever wants to jump in and answer. What? <laughs> she said she wants She's to volunteering. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> she wants to go first? OK. All right. So. What are one or two programs and resources that are currently available in your office that folks should know about? So I am the deputy treasurer for Unclaimed Property. Unclaimed Property is you know, our program, so I would definitely recommend that everybody go ahead and check out our website, claimitnevada.org. See if there's any unclaimed property in your name, any business name that you have owned. If you are the heir to an estate, we hold money in perpetuity until those uh, funds are claimed. So it's money that you didn't know was owed to you. Um, you know, I this could be your Starbucks money. So make sure you go right. Like, make sure you go and check. Keep Someone on. stopped by our uh, by our table earlier and said that they found unclaimed property that was fifty thousand dollars from a life insurance policy. Put a down payment on a house. <laughs> right. <laughs> This is like it's, you, you. It's not all pennies. <laughs> this is like you know when you put on that coat you haven't worn in a while and you find that twenty dollar bill, right? This this is that, right? We the largest amount that we've ever paid out was almost a million dollars. It oh was nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. 
Um, so, you know, we take any type of unclaimed property and we hold it until that owner can come and get it from us. Thank you, thank you. And I, I saw some hands and I will say this, we will leave time at the end. Um, we'll have about 15 minutes uh, towards the end for question and answer. So if you can just write them down and we'll circle back. Um, I was going to pitch unclaimed property as well as our wonderful college savings programs and the Achieving a Better Life Experience program that we run out of our office, which provides uh, savings accounts for uh, children with disabilities so it won't count against their, uh, their social benefits. So we don't have any unclaimed property, but I tell people all the time, folks often don't know that your congressional offices have a casework outlook in the state. In our DC offices, we handle legislation, but in our state offices, we handle casework for federal agencies. So, um, and we're gonna talk about some wins later, but just some examples. This week, everybody is going on vacation, so I have done about four emergency passport situations. Something as simple as that, to helping people work through Social Security and VA. You know, the VA, if we have any veterans, or you have a spouse that's a veteran, it's a very difficult, system to navigate and that's something that we can do so in our district office i have uh, five case workers who work on several different federal agencies so whether it's like i said a passport social security va even down to reaching out we're um, going through our own housing crisis in this state right now and years ago right after the pandemic i worked for senator reed and we had a housing department because the banks had been told by the federal government that they had to support homeowners. And so we literally had four staffers who worked with banks to make sure that homeowners were able to be made whole, to get their loan reset up, forgive me for not knowing the actual term, but it's just something people don't know. So literally every day, my five caseworkers are constantly working on different issues that are pertinent to our, our citizen, citizenry, as we say. I get people all the time who hire an attorney to help them get social security. Then the attorney calls our office. <laughs> and we're like, no, no, no. We need to speak to the constituent directly. Because we don't, we don't charge. They charge. And they get a portion of those folks' benefits for quite some time. But people just don't know. So it's not something, you know, they don't give us a huge budget to advertise with. But we try to get the word out because we do want to help folks. We, in Nevada, have a claim going on right now with folks who may have had family that worked at the test site. So you have family who works at the test site. They contract cancer. There is a fund within the federal government that is to support those folks and to give health insurance, but people don't always know. So we help navigate those things so that they're not getting charged outside fees from other folks. But it's just something to think about. That is something that your, your members, all members, everybody from Senate to the House have that. And Asha, I want, I want you to keep that. Can you provide the contact information or the, or the congressman's website where people can yeah. go, where they can uh, call Make or a phone number? Yep. Yes. It's just horsford.house.gov. So every member in the House, it's their last name, .house.gov. We are split up by congressional districts. So our district now incorporates downtown. Yay, very excited. I'm actually a constituent for the first time from my boss. Um, we have North Las Vegas, we have a portion of Summerlin. We go all the way up nearly to Reno. So our district covers a lot of rural Nevada as well. You also have Susie Lee and you have Dina Titus, and then you have both your senators, Rosen and CCM, Catherine Cortez Masto. And if you reach out to our office, we'll direct you to whoever you're supposed to go to. Um, I had a passport case the other day that came in. It was for Susie Lee's office, not us. But I encourage my staff, we don't just tell you to call this number. We call for you, we send the email, we make the connection, because the last, people, last thing people need when they're in need is to be passed on and on and on. I know I've experienced that, and so I get on the phone like, I want a supervisor now. And they're like, I can help you. You don't want these problems, just connect me <laughs> to the supervisor. You <laughs> so don't want that smoke, that right? right? <laughs> so just horsford.house.gov, if it's not us, we'll get you connected to the right person. But definitely it's a resource and everyone should take advantage if they need it. And I know it's a cliche. I mean, we're, we're all government workers when we say, you know, we're the government, we're here to help. You know, that, there's that joke. But we, we really are. We really do want to support. There's a reason why we work in public service. It's because we are here to serve you. And so um, we understand there are some bad apples out there. But as you can tell from these ladies, these ladies are wonderful. And they want to do what's right for our community. So all right, all right. OK, so we, we got our next one. 
How did availability of government resources change during the pandemic and what can we expect in the near future? This is a good one. I mean, we're still kind of in the pandemic. The federal government is getting ready to, um, I don't know what's the word, undeclare, <laughs> undeclare the pandemic in May. And so we've been living in this bubble for a little over three years now. And so, you know, what changed and what can we expect with, with um, what is the correct word that I'm looking for? How we call it's it? It's no longer it's an emergency. They're yeah, the, ending the emergency they're status. ending the emergency status for the pandemic. So what does that? What can we expect from federal government and from state government? So I'll I'll start. Um, the federal government did the pandemic was something nobody was prepared for at all. I remember. Uh, being working from home and being on the phone, the first thing that we had to do as a Nevada delegation is help people understand that gaming is our lifeblood. So when the feds were looking at how to save systems and, and businesses, gaming was not at the forefront. Because if you don't live in Nevada, gaming is just something fun to do. Whereas here, it keeps our whole state afloat. So having those conversations and making sure they were included, the federal government came in with everything. I feel like every other week or so was another program we were trying to roll out, whether it was PPP or EIDL or you know, um, the additional unemployment. And not every system was rolled out perfectly. We definitely know that that was an issue. Um, but there was a one program that uh, we are, we've been on calls all week, and a lot of folks don't understand, um, which is our SNAP benefits, the food stamp benefits. Um, Currently, there are folks who want to get rid of SNAP, period, which we do not want. But because we're ending the emergency uh, pandemic situation, they're going to roll back, which means it was for a time. It's not something that had been planned, but because it was an emergency, they made it happen. But what we're seeing is, especially in these states, we have a lot of people on fixed incomes who were eligible for like $30 a month food stamps. When I was in college, I had a son, and I was struggling, and I applied for food stamps, and they told me I got $26. I was like, you can literally keep that because the appointments aren't even worth that. I got it one month, and then they came back and told me they made a mistake, and I had to pay back my $26. <laughs> so I understand where folks are coming from. If you're on a fixed income, and you're only getting $30 in food stamps, but during the pandemic, you got $300 a month in food stamps. And we know that is rolling back. So my boss, he's called, I, I kid you not, my staff, at least three or four times, like, well, what are you guys, what are we going to do? What are we going to And I was like, sir, what are we going to do? <laughs> we got to figure this out. Um, it's going to hit Nevada hard. It's going to hit them hard. And this is it's going to hit all of us hard because one thing is whether you get food stamps or not, you're impacted when your neighbor doesn't have what they need. So our systems are coming together, the state, the county, the city. We're having those conversations. We're working with Three Square. We're working with all these folks. The cost of food has gone up mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, I went to McDonald's, which I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> went to McDonald's. My chicken McNugget meal was $11. I was like, dear Lord, but the cost of food has gone up. That's something trite. When we talk about what happens in the grocery store, people are facing a huge crisis, and if we don't come together as a community and use all the resources that we have, that's a program that's ending. It was never a forever program. That's hard to explain to people because it fit a need, but it was never a forever program. The same thing with Medicare and Medicaid. People who weren't normally qualified, qualified during the pandemic. That is coming to an end. So we're trying to find ways <clears throat> to get people back in and get them where they need to be, get them connected with our state health insurance, because folks just don't know. So these things happened, they got access, and now it's going to be rolled back. Um, all across the hill, we're talking about how terrible April may be, because we know that this is coming. We don't have all the answers yet. It's something that we're gonna have to change in, um, in our laws. The SNAP benefit and all those things haven't been addressed since the 90s. We have to go back to the calculation and re redo it for now with inflation and everything. Um, it's a literal act of Congress. That's not a joke. It's going to take a lot of people agreeing. And what we're facing right now is you have people who want to get rid of it, period. And then, so how do you build consensus to change the uh, calculation when you have folks who don't want it here at all? I think those are the two that are at the front of my mind right now. I know that PPP and EIDL literally save businesses. I hear from folks, everybody from Las Vegas Athletic Club, they had signs at the athletic club when people walked in thanking their federal delegation because it saved them. To the movie theaters, the movie, the cannery on Craig, they did the same thing. 
These funds came in at the last minute sometimes, but they came in and they really did save businesses. But we still lost a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's something to be aware of, especially when you talk about women in business and the additional pressure that we have. So we're trying to figure these things out, but it's important that we have the conversations to know where people are hurting. So I'm trying to think of some positive, positive things to say. We well, do have the infrastructure bill. That I, I was gonna say, can you maybe talk about what as a community we can do? You know, you have all of these strong women that have lots of, uh, that, are, that are very smart. Are there things that as a community we can be doing to try to address some of these things? I think one of the things that, I mean, we have Three Square. Three Square, I don't know how many of you, during the pandemic, we were looking for ways to serve. And uh, through my sorority and through my office, we would do the food banks and pass out food all over the valley. Not just in the sides of town you think, but everywhere. We had people pulling up in Mercedes trucks, getting food put into the trunk of their car. I think the one thing that folks can do is number one, be of service because the way a lot of these organizations are able to do more is because if they don't have to pay for help. If they have to pay for help and pay for food, they can't be as accessible. I tell people all the time is to share the word, especially with our seniors. I'm big on how we take care of our elders. The last thing you do for an elder is send them a link or send them a phone number. <laughs> I, you can't do that. My mother is a college professor and I don't do that with her. She's like, no, figure this out. I encourage people to find ways to be of service to these organizations that are trying to do the work. If your group can just take you know, one day a month and be available. The other thing is to help tell the story, help get people connected. Let us know, everybody up here has a way to connect you to some resource. A lot of people are suffering in silence. They're suffering at home. Nobody knows what they're going through. If you find those people, if you find the opportunity to share the information, please do. Because we do have resources, but people don't always know about them. So I think those would be the first two things. Wonderful. How about at the state treasurer's office? What, what changed during the pandemic and what can we expect moving forward? Um, so the pandemic really brought forward an opportunity for unclaimed property to partner with other agencies. Particularly, I'm sure you guys heard in the opening, the treasurer speaking how um, unclaimed property paired up with the um, unemployment insurance group um, or unemployment benefits group and we got the listing of people who were applying for unemployment and were able to look through our database and see who has unclaimed property in our system and push out a letter to say hey we have your money come get it from us you know we can't speak for other agencies but we can partner with them we can help um, in those ways and you know, it, it continues to grow. You heard the treasurer talk about how we cannot push out a check, um, and or we weren't able to push out a check. Um, now we can. Now we're also working to get our law changed to make it so that we can get access to other government resources so that we have the information um, as to where somebody might live um, so that we can try to pair up that unclaimed property proactively rather than waiting for our constituents to come to us. Yeah, so for all of you who are like, I don't want the government in my business, they don't need to know where I live, this, that, and the other, <laughs> right? Prime example why it's important to make sure that you um, maintain your contact information so that way when programs happen, when things happen, there's a way f for people to find you, right? You never, you never know. I mean, none of us in here would do anything bad, so we have nothing to worry about, right? <laughs> for people looking for us, so yeah. Ms. Kirsten? So I think, I'll, I'll speak to state government as a whole, and I think specifically I'm thinking of the legislative session which we're in right now. I think the pandemic uh, forced a lot of folks to think creatively about how they deliver services. So uh, you used to have to go to the Grant Sawyer building if you wanted to testify on a bill, and now you can do it via phone and you can live stream the hearings, the floor sessions, everything's live streamed nowadays, and I think that's so helpful. Um, something I'm really passionate about, about is information equity and making sure information and resources is available in a way that everybody has access to, and it's not just on a board posted in a building that not everybody can get to or not everybody can get to from eight to five, so. Absolutely, and uh, you know, as far as access goes, um, because it is so easy now, 
everybody should be engaged. We are very busy people, right? But to Asha's point, right, there are so many things that are happening in, in our government. We need to make sure we're engaged. They actually speak on our behalf. They work for us. So if you have an opinion about something, there is an opportunity for you to, um, to speak to your local legislators, to speak to your federal delegation, and we as the community need to make sure that we're taking uh, that opportunity to do that. And so I think that's wonderful um, that there is more accessibility. Like we said, the legislative session is, is going on right now. And so look at the bills because you know what? These bills that pass are gonna become your reality come um, July or January. And if uh, what I get a lot of, oh, well, when did that change? Right, get involved, get involved. Wonderful. Any, anything else on, on that before we move on to our, our, our next question? Wonderful. Okay, so what are some ways that people and programs from your agency are making a difference within our state? Um, and do you have any constituent stories that you'd like to share? I know, Asha, you kind of started this, but maybe, maybe Kirsten, you want to jump in? So I have a funny constituent story that I'll share, and I think this answer... we got to keep them we gotta yeah, keep this going. Answer so this answer gets good. to yes. one of the, um, the later questions, asleep. but we had an individual who reached out to us multiple times, and he had apparently lost his wallet every time. Like, he keeps losing his wallet, so he keeps calling us, thinking that we'll just, like, I guess give him more money. But wow. it's um, fairly consistent, and yeah, it's it's always entertaining, you know. I think he means well. So. so explain to people, though, why somebody losing their wallet would be calling you in the first place. So we're the treasurer's office, and I think they're, um, <laughs> they think, I think everybody thinks we're like Scrooge McDuck, and we have just like a pile of money that we dive into, which is not the case. Please? But yeah, it's always yeah. entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But outside of the funny story, what, what other, uh, I know you talked about the college uh, program. Talk a little bit about that. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, women in this audience that have families, whether they're mothers or um, you know, they're rich aunties, whatever it is, but look, talk a little bit about that college fund. So we have multiple college savings programs in our office, and if you, when you leave here, there's a, there's a table right here that you can get more information about us. So we have a student loan ombudsman in our office who um, can help you troubleshoot any complaints, questions, concerns, um, Anything regarding student loans, I know student loans are kind of in flux right now, but if you have any questions at all, please, please reach out to her. Um, she's wonderful. She actually saved um, a teacher, I think it was last year, over $100,000 in student loans. So even if you think there's no options for you, definitely still reach out. There may be you know, some niche program that you've never heard of, but she has because this is what she does you know, eight hours a day. Um, we also have the prepaid tuition program, which allows you to uh, prepay for tuition for in-state college tuition here in Nevada, and you can use your benefits nationwide, but they'll pay up to the amount of Nevada tuition. We have 529 accounts uh, run out of our office. We have five partners who offer 529 accounts with us, and those are tax advantage savings accounts for higher education and other um, you can also use it towards uh, like a trade school apprenticeship, that sort of thing, so it's not just strictly four-year degrees. We also administer the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship, which is up to $10,000 in uh, college tuition for those who stay in Nevada uh, to an NC institution. And that's for the best and brightest, so I think it's a 3.5 GPA that the student needs to get. Um, there's so many, that's all. <laughs> yeah. But you know what, you hit on something that it, that's in the national news that I, I wanna tap into Asha about, that's, that's student loans. <laughs> Right, so you, you talked about you know SNAP benefits, and but there's also a lot of conversation about student loans and student loan forgiveness. And are you guys getting a lot of calls around that? Are you guys able to provide assistance? Can we talk about um, the student so, loan situation? Because there is a there is a case in the Supreme Court, and my understanding is that student loan repayments will start 60 days after that court case is decided or July 1st, whichever comes first, 60 days after July 1st, whichever comes first. So um, for all of us who got student loans and we ain't been paying nothing for the past three years, <laughs> right? <laughs> been using your student loan money to buy, you know, shoes and handbags, right? Like the situation- That's coming to an end. <laughs> your situation is about to come to an end. So can you right. talk a little bit about that? So let me tell the, the big story that I don't think a lot of folks, some folks, 
We had a student loan program during the pandemic that President Biden put in place. I was begging people to apply, including my own child. I was like, please apply for this. He did apply. He applied at the very end, so we haven't heard on his. But just last week, my mother, who has her PhD, I told you she's a college professor, she got $167,000 in student loans forgiven. I have a friend who got $180,000. I have a constituent who got $120,000. People did not apply for the program. <laughs> we did social media, we did workshops. A lot of people didn't apply. The people who applied, they're through the second round right now. That program is closed. It was the public student loan uh, forgiveness, but they changed the parameters during the pandemic. So all that time you weren't paying payments counted like you paid payments. So people were eligible who weren't eligible before. My mother's about to retire. She literally, she told me that at the post office when she got the letter, um, and she sat with a friend of mine who you guys may know who said I could tell her story, um, Judge Belinda Harris in North Las Vegas, helped my mother do her application because my mother and I, we can't work together on things like that. It just doesn't, I was like, but I got somebody who can help you. Um, Belinda got 180,000 forgiven and she walked my mother through the process. When she got that letter, she said she sat in the car at the parking lot She's a preacher's wife, so she cried, she thanked God, she said people probably thought she was sick because at 66, she's about to retire. And to retire with an eight to $900 payment over her head every month was the reason she was going to keep working. And so that's been forgiven. Now my son doesn't have nearly as much, but we're hoping we get that same report. It didn't go based on income, it went based on any type of public service job. I had people who were like, I didn't work in public service, apply anyway. Apply anyway, people who worked at nonprofits. Um, we're gonna start telling their stories, those of us, those that allow us to do so. The other program that's held up in the Supreme Court right now, which would be amazing, because it's an automatic 10,000 off, or if you received a Pell Grant, 20,000 immediately. We need this to pass. The biggest issue in the last election was student loan debt. And having, uh, you know, being a parent of a young man who recently graduated from college, it does keep them from making decisions. You know, I want him to buy a house. He's like, Mom, we can't buy a house because we got this. And we're going back and forth on that. He's going to buy a house. I can't make that more clear to him. I'm like, you will buy a house. But it, I mean, if anybody here is paying him, you know what it means. It, that's a monthly bill that you must pay no matter what. And the interest on it is insane. I finally got to the point. I've been out of college 20 years. And I'm finally at the point where I'm on the other side of not paying interest and mine will be paid off shortly. But I didn't even apply for the program. Um, I was trying to figure if everybody in my family was doing it, we probably got our share, and I'm pretty close to being paid off. But student loan debt is literally crippling, not just the next generation. You know, my mother is 66. It's crippling her generation too, because once you're on a fixed income, six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month, when you borrow 20,000, but you're paying back 60,000, it's not okay. So beyond doing that, we also need to work on legislation, which it does exist, where we're trying to say, you cannot charge this kind of interest. This is insane. And the compounding interest, I was a poli sci major, so I can't explain it all to you. My baby was an econ major, he could. But the way the interest, it, it's, in, it's ridiculous when you look at it. And if you have taken out those loans, you know what it means. So I think the key thing is, Pay attention to what's coming out. If you're confused about it, please call us. I have people who send me TikToks, which I love TikTok, I'm not supposed to. We probably won't have it much longer, but right now. And they'll send it to me and they're like, it said we can do this. I will literally call that agency and say, is this real? And they'll tell me, no, it's not real, no. But get information, ask the questions, because there are resources out there and we don't want you to miss out. I want everybody to have a hallelujah praise like my mother did behind $167,000 forgiven. Thank you, thank you. So you brought up TikTok, and uh, you know, I think that's a wonderful segue into our next question. How do we feel social media has impacted the availability of government resources, and what should people be mindful of, right? There's social media is all over the place. I mean, tic I, I don't use TikTok, but. Don't, don't start. <laughs> I don't use much of anything, but social media is very prevalent in our community. Um, we know most of Generation Z, that is how they communicate, that is how they, uh, that is how they gather information. How, how does that impact government resources and how can, as government agencies, we, we use that to make sure we're spreading the word and getting information out? Go 
ahead, Miss Danielle. Um, so, you know, it's like anything else. Everybody's got an opinion, mm -hmm. and you know, some people use Facebook, TikTok, like a diary, to voice those opinions as though they're fact. <laughs> um, some people use it for better and provide things that they learn throughout their life um, that could actually help somebody else. So whatever you see on social media, my recommendation is trust but verify. Um, if you think that there's something that's too good to be true, look up um, that agency, call them directly, see if it's accurate, <laughs> and then move forward. Um, you know, with social media, we, we are, our office is able to get the word out a lot um, faster, a lot, uh, we get a lot more responsiveness from social media than we do from our statutory, statutorily required um, advertisements in newspapers. So, you know, it does serve its purpose. I would just say, make sure that that is not your um, Bible to life. <laughs> and, and, and with that, I know that uh, a lot of government agencies actually have um, their own social media pages or presence. Um, does the treasurer's office have one? Yeah, so um, unclaimed property. Which ones? Yeah. Unclaimed property has a Facebook. So does the treasurer's office um, in general. And I believe that most of the college savings stuff. If you guys are looking more for college savings, um, you can. And I'm sorry, Kirsten. <laughs> um, but if you're looking for more of that stuff, you can look on their Facebook. They post things for unclaimed property, and we'll post things for college savings too, just so that you guys know that we are linked together. Both, the, both of those are valid uh, social media accounts. <laughs> yeah, Asha, does Congressman Horsford have some valid social media accounts that you can share so we know yes. we're going to the right places? Our, we, we do have, and I should know what it is, we do not have an official TikTok. We have a campaign TikTok. Um, federal law, we are not allowed to have official TikTok because there are issues with it. But we have Instagram, we have Facebook, and all of it, if you just look up Stephen Horsford, it will come up. Um, we use it, we've been doing Instagram chats with different people, which are IG Live, I guess. I'm getting, all, I'm Facebook, I'm learning Instagram. I had to have somebody help me. Yeah. Like me. Yeah. I had to have somebody help me, a young person this weekend, my right. god sister. <laughs> I was like, look, I want to post what I Doesn't did this weekend. Doesn't that feel different when you have yes. to ask somebody else? Right. I was like, oh. And, you know, she kind of rolled her eyes, and then she helped me. <laughs> so it was fine. But really, I tell people, in this game, you're talking to the average Walmart shopper. And when you say that, it doesn't mean that they're not smart. It means they don't have time. And if we don't learn how to get information out to people in short Burst. Mm -hmm. It needs to be short, it needs to be informative, and you have to draw them in because you're competing with everything else. And that's what a lot of folks don't understand. They want to do it the way they've always done it. They want to speak at this 10,000 foot level. If I'm the average Walmart shopper, I'm trying to run in, run out, I don't want to be bothered. How do I get information to people? And that's what social media does. Um, I take breaks for social media during the day when I'm stressed out. I'm like, I'm going to go look at how to make sourdough bread. I have watched so many videos, yet to make it. One day I will. <laughs> but it's one of those things where it gets information and it hits people. It also does a disservice, to your point. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I have people who, ivermectin, I can't tell you how many people in my family I had to tell not to take the horse pill. I was like, this medication is for horses during <laughs> COVID. My aunts and different people, they're like, no, my doctor said. And I'm like, if you did a simple Google search, you would know that ivermectin is not for COVID. But they saw a video, and they saw a video targeted at them. They saw a person who looked like them, who said, I've not I didn't get COVID because of this. Please do your research. Like she says, trust but verify. Wonderful. Ms. Kirsten, anything you want to add in there about social media? I will just drop our handles. So uh, the treasurer's office Twitter is NV Treasurer, and our Facebook and Instagram is Nevada Treasurer spelled out. So those are the official channels. So that's where you should be getting information from. So speaking of information, we are in the middle of a Nevada legislative session. And so uh, want to talk a little bit about how that impacts you. So. Um, you know, what are some key bills that are going on right now that you're following or that are important to your offices? 
So there's five really, really great ones. They are sponsored by the Nevada State Treasurer's Office. Um, there is AB 28, which would establish a baby bonds program in Nevada, and effectively that would provide uh, grants of $3,200 to every child born uh, under Medicaid in our state, once they turn 18, that money has grown, obviously, because we would invest it, and that money has grown, and they can use that money uh, towards buying a house, uh, opening a small business, going to higher education, uh, multiple of uses. So that's really exciting. Hopefully it'll pass. It passed out of committee yesterday, so um, it'll go to the first house hopefully pretty soon. There is also a bill, AB 45, um, that allows our office to create a, a student loan repayment program for healthcare workers, so in demand fields in healthcare, I think we're allowing up to $120,000 repaid if you uh, promise to serve in a community that's currently underserved by that uh, specialty. And there is an investments bill that is highly technical, that is way outside my pay grade, so I won't go into that. And then we have a wonderful unclaimed property bill um, that's also moving, and then we have one related to the State Infrastructure Bank. So very exciting stuff from our office this session. Wonderful. Ms. Danielle, anything to add? No? Okay. And Asha, I know that you, you're federal government, but um, you know a lot of what happens at the state level sometimes can impact federal and vice versa. Is there anything uh, that, at, that you're watching in the state that you believe could have an impact um, federally or impact the work that you do? Yeah. Um, I just, we've had different legislators call and want the boss to put his finger on different bills. And I learned a long time ago, the state is the state and the feds are the feds. He was a state senator. We like to let them do their thing and then we do our thing. But the way this all works, you know, the feds send the money to the state. The state sends the money to wherever it needs to go. So that's how we do come together. He will be speaking at the state legislature. Um, we're still looking for a date. Each member goes up and speaks. I think um, for us on a federal level, the thing we're most excited about is the infrastructure bill, which is one of those things that we've talked about for a long time. I feel like it didn't get the attention that it probably deserved because it is like an earth shattering one time in a million bill to happen. And it's going to support states and construction and projects for decades to come. So people should pay attention to that. Um, I had my staff pull just because I was like, we do, we get a two week thing that tells you what bills are coming out or what funding is coming out. So I'll just give you an example. Out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill on March 23rd, which is uh, in a couple days, the assisting federal facilities with energy conservation technologies grant program. The thing we have to learn in Nevada, we send a lot of money to the feds. We do not apply to get it back. We have to apply for these grants. So I don't know if anybody is in here from Grant Lab, but I absolutely adore Grant Lab. Um, they've been working on that, Miles Dixon and the folks over there. When these grants come out, they're an opportunity for us to get a return on our investment. This one may not fit whatever it is you're trying to do. Infrastructure is different. The thing that's big for me in infrastructure right now is broadband. And our district, like I said, a lot of it is rural, and not just the rural areas. What we saw during the pandemic was kids couldn't go to online school because their neighborhoods didn't have solid broadband. So you had kids right here in Las Vegas who had challenges. They put broadband on trucks and had the trucks stop in certain neighborhoods so kids could connect. Broadband is important. Think of everything that you do on your phone and on the internet. There's a lot of money coming out of the federal government for those programs. So please pay close attention to those because we want to get it out and make sure that people are able to connect because that's where society is headed. Uh, as federal, are you able, in your constituent services, are, are, is your office able to assist with grants? So there are lots of grants, you know, for those uh, dealing with small business, you have SBA, um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the agencies we think um, people should know about, but can constituents, if they are applying for a grant, call your office to receive assistance? They can, now what we cannot do is write the grant for you. I am a formal grant writer. I used to be a grant writer, I don't do it anymore. We can't write for you, we can do letters of support. One of the things that we have coming up is we're gonna do an agency by agency workshop so that they can talk about their grant. So the first one was Department of Justice where I wanted people to be able to get on a webinar, hear from the Department of Justice what grants are coming out what they're looking for, what they're funding, and we can get you that information. We can also help you get connected to technical assistance. Um, we cannot identify a grant writer for you. Um, there are some folks here today, if you look at your 
your paperwork, that would be great. I always mention Grant Lab. They do more of um, the larger grants and system grants, but they also can connect you to resources. So please look at grant funding. If you need a letter of support, we definitely want to, to be there. And if you, if you have questions, if you want somebody to get on the phone and talk to you about the grant before the deadline, we can help with that too, before the deadline. After the deadline, <laughs> we cannot. But before the deadline, we can help with that. And I know uh, uh, working with Clark County Economic Development, I was able to work with the treasurer's office during the pandemic. We uh, gave out um, some dollars, some federal dollars that the county received um, for small business grants. But can the treasurer's office, can you speak about any maybe upcoming grants or maybe potential future grants that you guys are thinking about? So I'm not aware of any um, okay. directly out of our office, but always you know, stay up to date feel free to call our office with any questions or if we're happy to connect anybody who calls our office to whichever resource. So if you say, hey, I'd love a grant to start a new business, I just don't know who to call, call us, we'll figure it out or we'll help you get there. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so um, I think you know it's time to maybe open it up for uh, a few questions. So um, I am happy to, if you have a question, raise your hand, I'll bring a microphone to you so we make sure that our panelists um, can hear you. Okay, not everybody all at once, right? We're gonna start this again. We gotta beg people to ask a question. I have a question about your office. So how do people get involved <laughs> with the the Office of Economic Development and like what does what does your office do and how can we get involved in that? Wonderful. Okay, so she's going to put me on the spot, right? <laughs> um, so the uh, Clark County's Office of Community and Economic Development was really born um, out of an opportunity to support a number of different things. Um, the office was started just before the pandemic hit, and it was kind of a blessing because we were quickly able to pivot to support small business. So as mentioned, we uh, received funding through CARES, and we were able to set up small business um, grants. So uh, I think we gave out $5,000 grants, $10,000 grants. A program that we're running right now actually goes from $5,000 to $100,000 for small businesses that need to build resiliency, capacity, um, or recover from COVID. And it's really a technical assistance grant, meaning what we found, even when we say, okay, we want to be here to support you, we're government, so there's a certain amount of paperwork that needs to be filled out. Small businesses were struggling with the paperwork. And so this technical assistance is really to support businesses and getting them to where they need to be so their business is operating and has an opportunity to be successful that they're not making money despite of themselves but because of themselves. And so um, we focus on small business right now, just kind of outgrowth of what happened from the pandemic. But we're also looking at opportunities to diversify our economy, right? We. Um, we're one of the hardest hit communities um, during the pandemic. We had an unemployment rate of almost 30%. That is because we rely heavily on the hospitality industry. So when the strip shut down, 20, I, I don't even know how many people lost their jobs. We had a 30% um, unemployment rate. Like that is not sustainable. And so we really look on diversifying our economy. So think new industries, healthcare, making sure we have a, you know, those are high skilled, high wage, jo high wage jobs. Um, manufacturing is another one. Technology is another one. So we look to companies and communities outside and say, okay, this is a new business. They wanna expand. Come to our community to expand, create those jobs in our community. So those, that's the type of work that we do. Any other questions? I saw a couple more hands. As a grandparent to a child in high school that lives in another state, are any of these resources available for her? I'm, re I'm a resident here and she's someplace else. What can I do? So yeah, a 529 account, uh, she, I guess depending on her age, so if she's about to graduate, a 529 account could be used maybe for some future expenses, but um, that's a tax advantage savings account for students. Um, the prepaid tuition program, you have to be a Nevada resident, as does the Governor Gwen Millennium Scholarship. So I would point you towards a 529 account. 
I think you answered my question, but um, is 529, are you able to use it for out of state? If, if, if your child is going out of state, they're not staying in Nevada, does the 529 plan cover that? And is the millennial scholarship only for UNLV, UNR, and Nevada State, or is there any other uh, colleges that's covered by that? Thank you. Yeah, so the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship, that is any entry institution. So um, TMCC up in Carson City, you can use it there. You can use it. There's two other institutions. We have just a handful of students that go. I think it's Roseman and then one other one that I'm blanking on, but there's two other institutions that you can use Governor Gwynn at in Nevada. And as far as 529, that is an IRS um, kind of sanctioned program, so you can use those benefits anywhere in the United States. They're totally transferable. Um, multiple account or plans across every state, not every state, but some states have 529 accounts, so yeah. So Kirsten, I think you talked about a savings fund for special needs kids. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so it's called the ABLE program and it's run out of our office alongside our college savings division. It was passed by Congress and I think 2014-ish, but I'm sure I'm wrong on that. But it's, uh, it's a savings account for children with disabilities, and it allows them to save without uh, threatening their social services or any type of social benefits they receive. It allows them to uh, have a living wage. One of our interns from two years ago now, he, um, he suffers from a disability, and he wanted to open a popcorn stand. So he was able to do that and actually make money from his popcorn stand because of the ABLE account. So. Ladies, it has been an absolute pleasure. Can you please give these wonderful ladies a round of applause? Give yourselves a round of applause for staying awake after lunch. Um, again, honored to be moderating this panel. Thank you guys so much for uh, attending and joining this session. Um, we will stick around for a couple of minutes if anybody didn't get a chance to answer questions or if anybody's looking for additional information. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really do appreciate you.